Hey folks, Michael Howie here. Have you subscribed to Defender Radio on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or TuneIn? Subscribing is free, lets you know when a new episode is online, and helps me spread the word about the show and the advocacy of the Fur Bears. Send me a screenshot of your follow or subscription, and I'll enter you in a draw to win one of two free tees from the Fur Bears to say thank you for your support. Send your screen grab to me at michael at thefurbears.com or DM it via Facebook or Twitter. Winners will be announced next Monday. This is Defender Radio. Defender Radio is brought to you by the Association for the Protection of Fur-Bearing Animals. It's the week of August 21st, 2017, and this is Michael Howie welcoming you to episode 442 of Defender Radio. Shooting a bear is remarkably easy get someone to help you find them. You get the equipment and learn how to use that equipment to line up the shot. Add in a bit of patience and then you either push a button or pull a trigger. Hunting grizzly bears remains a controversial subject after the end of trophy hunting of grizzly bears was announced in British Columbia last week to resounding cheers and applause of wildlife lovers around the world. Of course, we've learned that the fine print indicates that outside the Great Bear Rainforest, grizzly hunting will be business as usual. Hunters just can't take the head, paw, or pelt of the bears and need to take the meat with them. Even with these changes, grizzly bear killing and hunting can quickly come into conflict with a growing and significantly more economically beneficial industry, grizzly bear viewing. Trish Boyum and her husband Eric own Ocean Adventures, a successful ecotourism business on the coast, and are also advocates for the protection of grizzlies and other wildlife. Trish joined Defender Radio to share her reaction to the announcement on the end of trophy hunting, how her husband confronted armed hunters trying to poach a grizzly bear in a provincial park, and why only one type of shooting has a future for grizzlies in British Columbia. To start out, I thought it would make sense to talk a bit about what your business looks like, because you are on the polar opposite side of all of those who have been involved with grizzly bear trophy hunting uh, in the ecotourism side. So what, what exactly do you offer to people who are interested in grizzly bears or in photography? Uh, yes, uh, we offer trips that last from six days to 10 days. Um, the bear viewing uh, trips that we offer are in the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, so people come with us for between six and 11, 10 days, say, um, from all people, the people are from all around the world. Um, we're getting a lot more Canadians and a lot more British Columbians coming with us lately, which is great because that means that they'll understand it all. They'll see it all. They'll understand the true nature of grizzlies. And, um, you know, that they're not the man-eating monsters that the hunters want everybody to believe. Um, you know, that they're actually um, very sentient beings and um, not just not dangerous. I mean, we give them respect, but, um, but they're not at all as most hunters uh, would um, describe. So we take people out and um, a lot of people that come with us are photographers, but we have probably an equal amount of people that come to see grizzly bears that are just there just to enjoy them. I mean, they're an iconic species. They stand for, uh, you know, everything that is wild, really. And um, and so uh, the people come with us for a variety of reasons, but, but mostly to see grizzly bears. I would say that most of our clients are are with us to see bears and primarily grizzly bears. And what does it mean to be non-consumptive? This is, uh, we were talking just before we started recording, and this is something I think that really needs to be discussed more publicly, is you are, um, and uh, I encourage you to to discuss what you said to me about this before, but you are using the quote-unquote resource in a way that's not taking it, uh, that it remains in place. Uh, how do you explain that difference, and why did you you give me and I could feel the evil eye over the phone when I said resource? <laughs> right. 
Yes. Well, we don't like to call grizzly bears or any of our wildlife a resource. Um, that's what hunters like to call them, a resource. Uh, they like to, I, I don't know if it's because they like to say in the same sen- sentence that they are um, harvesting a resource. Mm. We don't see, we don't, therefore, in that context, certainly, which is the context that you most see it in media or written about, uh, it's not a resource to us. And to us, they're not harvestable. We're not talking about farm animals. We're not talking about um, lettuce and tomatoes. We're talking about real wild animals that are actually sentient beings. You know, they they're not really their personalities are not that different than a lot of human personalities you know some of them are grumpy some of them are can be funny um you know if you watch sit down and watch a a female um uh bear with her cubs i mean there's one mom that when she, when she nurses her cubs she holds the cubs and she hums while she's holding them so you know when we have when we have people with us that are also mothers when they see things like that, they realize, you know, that, that, you know, grizzly bear mothers are not a lot different. And a lot of people say, well, you know, you have to be careful of grizzly bears because they're ferocious and all that sort of thing. Well, you know, most of the time that mankind has come into, um, into contact with bears that are unhappy is because A, they've gone near the bear's food. Uh, you know, like say, for example, more in the interior than where we are, but if they'd killed, if the bear had killed, say, an elk or something like that, they would be protecting their food, just like any of us would protect our food. And, um, and if someone, and if the mother bears feel that their cubs are threatened, then, you know, they could, they, they may retaliate or they bluff charge or do what any mother would do to protect her young. So we don't see bears as being harvestable, uh, like, you know, fruit and vegetables. We see them as as another living being that we need to learn to appreciate and hopefully teach our, our guests to live with. Instead of it being us against them, we would need to all learn to live together, as with any species on the earth. Absolutely. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, I often find interesting is when we talk about any wild species, really, or any species at all, um, the the universal signal for go away, leave me alone is to sh- maybe push or shove away. Um, and this is something, you know, I'll see uh, with dogs who are unhappy or cats that are unhappy. We know they might, you know, they might be a little mouthy or they might push a little harder than usual with their paws. But you figure... They might even scratch you. <laughs> exactly. And that's not their intent. Their intent is not to harm. Their intent is no. to say go away. It's just so happens exactly. that with a grizzly bear... Uh, <laughs> you know, they're used to dealing with other bears of their size, not with us little fragile humans. Uh, so that can create issues of itself. And I think that's maybe where some of that fearsomeness comes from or that ferocity that is imagined is because even when they're casually saying no, it can be devastating. Oh, for sure it could be devastating. I mean, but the, the, the thing that most people need to realize is... Um, you know, that bears are giving uh, signals to us, if you know how to read them, mm-hmm. if you pay attention, if you wait long enough before you go in, um, and if you give them their distance and respect, the bears will let you know if they're not comfortable. They'll either move away, they have, a, uh, you know, some body language, some posturing that they will do if they're not happy with the situation. I mean, we have very, very rarely, I can think of two times where that's happened, where it's been directed at us. But usually when we see that, it's because there's another bear around that they're, that they're posturing, uh, for or against, as you may say. But, you know, you know, bears are actually very predictable. In fact, they're more predictable than human beings are by far. So if, so, you know, we've also been taught by a number of, um, elders from various, uh, First Nations communities on the coast and and also uh, from biologists that have worked in the field with them, uh, you know that bears, bears are just super, super intelligent animals, and they will know if you're coming in peace or if you're coming to get them, and so uh, or if you're threatening in some way. So, so they know this, they feel this, they smell it, they apparently can smell um, ammunition if it's there. So. Um, 
So this idea that, you know, that again, that they're man-eating, ferocious, unpredictable animals is just simply not true. Just simply not true. Uh, yeah, and again, I, as I say, I think that kind of, at any time we try and paint an animal as ferocious or a non-human animal as ferocious, uh, it's typically because we're not understanding or because we have exactly. created a scenario. And uh, as listeners know, my big uh, animal that sort of drew me into the wildlife world was coyotes, and it's very much the same. But uh, anyway, uh, when someone yeah. comes out uh, on one of your tours, what's that like? Because I think that might be, you know, uh, uh, I know different organizations, different businesses, different individuals will run these tours differently. Uh, you know, right. I know there's some who it's a very much a, a rustic, you know, you're going to portage your way through. And then there's others where it's maybe a little nicer or uh, not nicer, but a, a little less Rustic, I like that word. That's my word today. Um, so what what do people expect uh, when they can come out on a tour? Well, I think I think initially when they're first thinking of coming out to see bears, I, I don't think they're thinking as much about the accommodation. Um, you know, our 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 tours do differ um, from other tours offered in similar areas mostly uh, by the numbers of people we take at a time. So we take a maximum of five guests at a time. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have less because sometimes just a few people will want to book the whole boat. But, but on an average, we have, a, we have uh, five guests on board at a time. And that's compared to, uh, you know, up to 20 guests wow. on other boats. So quite a difference in numbers. There's one or two other boats that have, have uh, fewer numbers, not fewer than us, but maybe slightly more than us, um, but maybe not as many as, you know, 18 to 20 guests. So that's the biggest difference between us and a lot of the other tour operators in the area, the other boat-based tour operators in the area. Um, so I think most of our clients uh, that are waiting, like a long on waiting list to come uh, in the future, they want to come up with us primarily if they've never met us before. They're coming primarily with us to see bears in a small group setting. And we want to do the small groups uh, because we feel that it has the least possible impact on the behavior, the natural behaviors of the wildlife that we're wanting to view. So that's good for the bears. It's a win-win. It's good for the bears or whatever wildlife that we are uh, watching because we want them to carry on as usual. We don't want them you know, always looking at us and always worrying about us because we need to be eating all the time to, to, to stay healthy. So, so it's good for the bears, for example, and it's also, and it's also good for the guests because they get to see the natural behaviors of the animals. So, so those are some reasons. Now, you know, um, I don't think any of the two operators that are operating in the Great Bear uh, rainforest have what you would call rustic accommodations. I think all the guests are, you know, all the boats are very beautiful. They all have to be well maintained according to Transport Canada, uh, guidelines as passenger vessels. Um, you know, we, we like to, uh, we, I can only speak for us, but I, I think generally speaking, all the boats are, are pretty darn nice. The ones <laughs> that I've seen anyway. <laughs> But, um, but you know, our, our guests, it's a small group, uh, you know, they have meals together. The, the chefs that work with us are, um, you know, provide amazing, amazing food, uh, that, you know, that you would, uh, food that you would, uh, experience at a five star restaurant. Um, and they're experiencing it in they're having this beautiful food in the middle of, of the wilderness. So, um, yeah. And we, we also, uh, you know, one of the, the things that's also really important to us is that, you know, when we're operating in these areas, we're operating in the traditional uh, territories of, um, of various uh, First Nations people. Mm -hmm. So it's important to us that we have uh, agreements with those people and that when the people, uh, when our guests are on board with us, that they're learning uh, about those cultures in whose territories they're traveling. And, um, yeah, so we either take them to, vill to visit local villages and have them meet people in the village, or we have uh, First Nations guides working on board with us. That's so, great. Uh, that's, yeah. I think that's something that's absolutely wonderful. And I was speaking with um, 
uh, it was Megan Adams from Raincoast Conservation, and she's working on, uh, she'd done a study about salmon and how it impacts bears and the ecosystem. And I, I still can't explain it properly, but talking with her was quite nice. And yeah. uh, she was talking a lot about working with the coastal First Nations and combining mm-hmm. that traditional ecological knowledge with sort of the modern science she had been taught. Um, it's and it's, it's, it's a brilliant. really beautiful representation. And as I said to her, and I'll say again to you, to me, it, it represents the greatness that Canada can be um, as a nation of that coming together and working together as opposed to trying to separate. Um, Absolutely. So it's, it's always nice to hear that. And while I'm, you know, I'm, I'm aware uh, in various parts of our province that, you know, um, anyway, I'll drop that subject. (laughs) (laughs) Because it could get us into some trouble. But, you know, one of the things, one of the things that we, really honor and admire and feel very grateful for is the leadership by the First Nations people in whose territories we travel in the Great Barrier Rainforest. These are real leaders. And we can, uh, there are lots of people that have helped get the full ban that will start after this season of killing in the Great Barrier Rainforest. But I mean, it's, they're really, they're really the ones that have uh, with help from other people, yes. But they are really the ones that have led uh, the province to to this place where Absolutely. there will be a total ban on killing grizzly bears. Yeah, and that's something that I think is very obvious to those of us who have been involved in this uh, over the last few years. Um, yeah. As the campaigns have stepped up, as the Coastal First Nations have taken a true leadership role. Absolutely. And I would say are responsible almost entirely for that complete ban in the Great Bear Rainforest. Uh, it's it's something agree. to definitely uh, highlight and congratulate them on. Uh, and, yeah. and speaking of that, so, uh, you know, again, just sort of the, for clarity's sake, uh, the Great Bear Rainforest following this fall hunt will have a complete ban on uh, grizzly bear hunting or killing, period. Outside of the Great Bear Rainforest, it will be a ban on taking trophies. And what that looks like, we're not entirely sure still, but primarily... From our base understanding of what has been said by the government and from other analysts is that you won't be able to take the trophy, so the, the head paws pelt, you will have to take the meat, but you'll still be able to kill. There's going to be no restriction in killing um, outside of the Great Bear Rainforest. Uh, but let's let's go back. I, I mean, it was only a couple of weeks ago. It feels like months now after all of the, the writing and talking and, and meetings that have been going on about this. But uh, what was your reaction when, I mean, I was, I was walking home um, from an appointment and uh, I started getting texts popping up on my phone. Uh, it's like, you have to get home now. Um, and uh, I, I was, it, it was almost sort of a, is this real? Is it not real for me? What was your reaction uh, that afternoon when the news broke that the, the hunt would be completely done in the rainforest and outside the rainforest, the trophy aspect would come to an end? Well, of course, uh, and not just because we operate, uh, primarily in the Great Bear Rainforest, in the, in the traditional territories of the Coastal First Nations. Um, you know, we were obviously overjoyed and, um, so pleased that, that this was going to happen. Um, however, um, that was, you know, that can't be taken away from. However, uh, you know, as we speak, there is still business as usual going on across our province for the fall hunt. And, you know, we do question what that means for the bears, because if people think this is their last hurrah, what could be going on legally and not legally across the province in regard to killing the bears? So there was that question. And then, um, and then, uh, you know, you know, I, I grew up in the interior, uh, I know plenty of people that uh, hunt for food, but I don't know any that kill bears for food. And anyone that I have talked to or come across uh, regarding killing bears, and I'm talking any bears, not just grizzly bears, um, you know, they don't eat the meat, and they don't believe that anybody intentionally, with the primary reason of getting meat 
goes after a good leader. So, you know, for for the longest time, uh, those that kill for trophies have been saying, well, you know, it's for the meat. But, you know, there's plenty of um, evidence that that's not the truth or not necessarily the truth. Well, and that's, it's very uh, uh, reminiscent of when the spring black bear hunt returned to Ontario. Um, mm-hmm. And at first it was all about safety. Uh, we have to hunt the black bears because there's too many of them and they're stealing children. Um, <laughs> and then it was, oh, well, it's also about sustenance. We eat the meat and we do this and we do that. And finally, it, it, like well after it became established again, because uh, originally it was going to be this trial run and then a bigger trial run and now it's just a thing. Um, but it, it finally came out that it was entirely economics um, in saying that we make money when people come here to kill bears. We're okay with them killing bears. We like killing bears and we like making money. But there was all of these other arguments being thrown out there, um, trying to rationalize it before it finally came down to that. And I'm seeing some of that still happening now, sort of in the, the, I don't want to call it fallout, but in the sort of continuation of the discussions and debates about grizzly hunting in British Columbia. Um, Absolutely. And there's, there's lots of this, but ultimately like, does it come down to people want to kill these bears or people don't want to kill these bears? Uh, There was no information being presented that this was a scientific decision. Uh, It was very much a political choice. Do you think that will ultimately stand true or do you think we need to now have the science to maybe back up the fact that grizzly hunting uh, is not as sustainable or is not necessarily ethical as it has been painted? Well, I think when we talk about science, that we have to ask whose science are we using to to um, ascertain whether or not uh, the, the the killing of grizzlies should continue. And you know, if you talk to uh, those that kill them for you know cash kicks and trophies, um, you know they've got lots of science that backs up the fact that grizzlies should be killed. Um, now, if you talk to other scientists that have had a look over uh, the records of uh, grizzly kills in BC, you'll get an entirely different story. The fact of the matter is, is that no one knows exactly how many grizzly bears there are in BC. We do know that too many females are being killed, uh, even by even by government standards. Um, but you know, science is only one part of it. You know, economics could be another. Could be another uh, another argument, you know, where uh, grizzly viewing brings a lot more money. I'm sure you have all that information at, at uh, your fingertips, and employs a lot more people than does killing grizzly bears. Um, but you know, when it comes right down to it, uh, you know, 90% of British Columbians have said that they don't want it anymore. They this is not what they want our province to be known for. So I think that's really what British Columbians need to, to think about. Do they want our work, do they want the image of us uh, to be one of supernatural British Columbia, to coin an adage, uh, you know, where you see beautiful images of nature and, um, you know, beautiful wildlife and, you know, you can experience the real wild, the real wilderness. Or do you want the images to be the ones that, you know, you can see if you go on any of the sites that promote it, uh, you know, where there's people uh, with a dead bear, and you know, at their feet and they're, you know, cheering and smiling and grinning and all that sort of thing. Which which do you want? You know, you can't have one, you can't have these beautiful, you can't have supernatural British Columbia with images of, of, of dead bears and, and grinning killers. The two don't go together. Right. And you also need to think a little bit about, you know, this isn't discussed very much at all, if ever. You also need to think about what kind of people kill for the thrill or for a trophy. What kind, you know, what kind of people are they? Are they people that you want, like, turned loose in the, in our society? So. That's another that's another point that I think British Columbians or any any population is deciding about having um, grizzly bears 
not killed or any any other animals as well really yeah and i think uh this this is interesting just in a couple of folks i know who are hunters um mm. And, you know, friends of friends and so on. And they, they message me when I've done, you know, the live video with the breaking news or I, I've done blogs or, uh, and I'm sure more will email me and contact me after this episode airs. But um, they say, well, you know, you don't think all hunters are the same, do you? And they say, because, you know, that's, I'm not in support of what they're doing. And I, while I don't agree, I do think it's important to note there is that difference between people oh, who absolutely. go and kill There's a, a deer, two deer, whatever and eat it and those who go and kill a grizzly and take a picture and again i am not supporting either of these i think it's just important that we we recognize there is sort of those uh varying degrees or or areas of gray um oh absolutely yeah. we totally agree with that absolutely uh, well i couldn't be the one that goes out and does it i recognize that there are some people that do kill for meat for their freezer um you know uh do i agree with it well if they need the meat to feed their families then i agree with it um you know i i feel i feel bad for some hunters uh you know that they feel like they're being painted with the same brush as some people might paint those that kill for cash kicks and trophies but, you know, those people, if they don't want to be painted with the same brush, then they need to speak out. I And I applaud them whenever they do. Yeah. Because and I think it is important for everybody to understand the difference between somebody that takes a deer per year or a moose per year to be their family than those that are going out for other more insidious reasons. And I think that, uh, and I think that, you know, we all need to um, look ourselves in the mirror and ask why we do all kinds of things. And I think that um, that that's the case when animals are being are being killed. I think you need you need to ask yourself why why you're part of that. Um, I'm not vegan, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's it. it gets. It... I'm working towards vegetarian, though. I have to say. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, every step closer helps. Um, Absolutely. But it's, for a variety uh, it, of reasons. For yes. a variety of reasons. Yeah, and it's a very you broad know. issue, and it's one that uh, I'm, I'm glad through the podcast format we're able to kind of delve into a bit, because it's I have difficulty anytime someone says things are very, very black and white, uh, because Ooh, circumstances no. are so this varied. This is a very and, gray yeah. issue. Uh, yeah. But uh, moving on, because I feel like we could probably talk about that for the rest of the day. Mm, um, yeah, but just before we move on, I just... Mm -hmm. I want people to know that, uh, you know, that I'm not against, I'm not against hunting. I think what I'm against is why, why are the people going and killing a wild animal? You know, if it is sincerely, if their primary reason is sincerely for bringing meat home for their family, I get it. But if it's, if it's because they get some kind of a thrill out of it or, they, they want a trophy, whether that's a photo or whether it's taking on the part of the bear for the trophy. I don't get it. And I certainly don't approve of it. And I certainly don't want it a part of our culture. Um, and uh, talking about the, the economics of mm -hmm. uh, ecotourism, and I think this is really where people who are maybe on the fence about this, this is kind of what wins them over. And I was shocked the first time I started seeing these numbers when I started reading about ecotourism. Uh, and we're, you know, you can go back and I've got a couple, as, as, as you said, I have some of these on my fingertips. Um, there is, uh, a researcher, uh, going back, this, this is from 2014, uh, that found that, um, ecotourism was worth 12 times more. So bear viewing specifically is view is, uh, generating 12 times more in visitor spending than bear hunting and over 11 times more in direct revenue for the province of BC. Um, a more recent one, and this is uh, Faisal, uh, Dr. Faisal Musla, uh, Mula uh, on Twitter said he was going to send this over to me. I, ha I have not seen the actual study yet, but uh, if he says the information reported in this article is accurate, I, I definitely trust him on that. And it shows that a recent study has found that visitors spend $15 million on bear viewing in the Great Bear Rainforest, whereas hunters have spent $1.2 million. So we are literally talking at least 10 times as much money being spent. That, and that's not just, you know, someone putting down $10 instead of $1. 
that means jobs, that means ancillary services, that means infrastructure, it means everything, um, particularly with the Great Bear Rainforest, because you can't just fly into YVR and walk there. Um, no. So no. when there is such clear evidence... This is an important thing for people to, to realize, uh, for sure. And, and one of the things that we uh, work on with our guests is, is not having them just fly in and fly out. We, you know, many of our guests, especially the ones that are coming from outside of British Columbia, we encourage them to be spending time in the smaller communities. Uh, you know, I've even helped people arrange, uh, arrange driving tours, circle tours through BC, you know, like coming to us in Bella Bella on the ferry and then, um, you know, taking the ferry to continuing up to Prince Rupert you know, renting a car, driving back down through the interior. So so our guests really do, you know, they don't just come to us and then go away. I mean, there might be the odd one, but most of them are um most of them are spending a lot more money and a lot more time in BC just enjoying this amazing province. Well, yeah, and I think that's uh, maybe we we don't talk about it enough, but uh, where, last time I was in British Columbia, uh, my colleague Adrian uh, Nelson and I went up into one of the, the areas of rainforest. I couldn't tell you which one. I'm not familiar enough with that area, but um, sort of outside of North Van and uh, driving up. And we were, we were going to look for um, bears and various other things to try and get sort of for B-roll footage. And I think we spent two hours just driving up and sort of through some of the areas. And it's stunning. I mean, that was an enjoyable experience just driving through and looking at it and, and coming from Ontario, um, seeing these massive trees and he goes, Oh yeah, there's a bald Eagle. Oh, there goes another one. Oh no, that bear just chased them off. Like, like and it, it, I think when you live in BC, maybe you almost get a little used to it. But mm. for me to see that density of wildlife yeah. is very, yeah. very neat. And that's when I was in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Um, you know, the people are lovely. Yarmouth, the town is, is very quaint and nice. And it's got lots of cute tourist things, but I, uh, I went up on a, uh, Cessna, which was the first time I'd ever done that, uh, by the way, but, uh, we did a tour, um, looking at fur farms, but also around the coast, uh, which was incredible driving around, seeing the old areas, like it's yeah. just being there is enjoyable, let alone yeah. the part where it's, yeah, okay, now we're going to go do this photo thing. Uh, like it's an entire experience to yeah. enjoy these communities. And I would really, I especially now more than ever, I will encourage people to spend more time in the interior of our province as well because, you know, those are areas that need to understand the value of tourism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more than ever now because I'm pretty sure that there are going to be people that are telling them that, you know, Killing bears is going to bring them more money than uh, than tourists can, and and I don't agree with that. Um, I think that people can um, have all kinds of offer all kinds of tourism experiences, and uh, and not have to succumb to something that won't make them feel quite as good about what they're offering. So um, more than ever now, I'm you know starting with our clients. Like our clients this year have all their plans in place for what they're going to do before and after. Uh, next year, I'm really, really going to be talking to people a lot and suggesting that they spend, uh, you know, as much time in the areas that um, the government has said that they won't put a complete ban on, on uh, killing grizzly bears. I just, so they're just such beautiful parts of our province. But our province is so diverse. Mm. Yeah, it's an amazing place. And I just got that study from Faisal via Twitter. Um oh. So <laughs> I can now verify that that study is accurate, uh, what was reported on it. Uh, but again, it's you're talking um, uh, tens of millions of dollars um, yeah. in comparison. It's, it's uh, ridiculous, really. Yeah. Um, so there's yeah. reference, you know, a 1995 study estimated the direct, use of value, the direct use value of wildlife viewing in BC was $505 million. Another one based on 2001 data found that nature-based tourism contributed $1.55 billion in revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one was $783 million. So, like, it's, we're not talking chump change. We are talking no. huge industry money yeah. uh, with a lot of jobs and a lot of pay, uh, benefits. But uh, And a lot of jobs, as, as we've talked about, directly and indirectly. Yep. And I, I want to talk, too, about the 
conflict between viewing and killing, because this is something mm -hmm. that I know comes up a lot is, uh, I have seen some hunters or some hunting associations say we can do both. I've had people say, why not both? And I think it's a reasonable question to ask. Why not both? Can't we do grizzly bear viewing and grizzly bear killing? Um, and I know you have experience with this and a few other folks I've talked with, uh, including John Marriott, uh, a wonderful photographer out of Canmore, Alberta. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I think you all pretty much have the same answer to the question. Why can't we have both of these in the same areas? Well, there's a number of reasons. I mean, if you're a bear viewer, you know, you put yourself on on uh, a trip with us, like uh, for example. So you're out with Trish and Eric, um, and, uh, and we're watching bears on an estuary, and all of a sudden shots ring out. I mean, are you going to feel safe being there? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's the obvious, very obvious safety concerns. Um, then... Of course, there are the concerns for the bears, obviously, because, because, you know, in conjunction with our guests, the, the ones that we want to keep safe are, are the bears as well. So, you know, um, if bears are being, if bears are being shot at, they're not going to be good for bear viewing because they're going to see every human as a threat. So, um, so yeah, you just can't have the two. I mean, we've, we for the most part are taking people to, Areas that are what they call grizzly bear management units, where hunting is uh, not allowed to ha killing of grizzly bears um, for any reason is not allowed to happen in those grizzly bear management units. That doesn't mean that they don't happen, but uh, you know that there wouldn't be any poaching or any of that sort of thing going or any illegal hunting. Um, but it's unlawful in those areas to kill grizzly bears. Now we have also gone uh, to other beautiful inlets, I think some of the most beautiful inlets on the coast, um, and been, you know, looking uh, to see some bears and experience the beautiful wildflowers in the spring and all the, you know, beautiful birds with their babies and all that sort of thing, and, and then come back to the boat and we're having a lovely dinner and and all of a sudden there's a, a, a boat that shows up in the anchorage, a small boat that was a skiff off another boat. Um, and I said to Eric, you know, I don't, I don't really feel the love coming from that <laughs> boat. I said, I feel like they're up to something. And he said, oh, they're probably just in to set up crab traps. And I went, oh, well, maybe, but let's keep an eye on them. So we kind of watched what they were up to with binoculars. And they eventually went over to the, the side of the estuary, not very far from us. Um, and, uh, they took a garbage bag, a black garbage bag. Uh, with them ashore, and they also had guns with them. You could see their guns. And so we watched through the binoculars, and they had put out, uh, they had fish guts and, you know, things like that They're from fishing that they had set out, and then they went and hid behind a rock not too far away. So what they were doing was putting out food in hopes that a bear would smell it and come along and that they would then shoot the bear. Well, bear baiting in British Columbia, at least, not in every part of the world, but in British Columbia, baiting bears is is uh, against the law. So anyway, a long story short, Eric went over and talked to them, and they said, well, yes, uh, that's what they were hoping to do, is to bag themselves a bear, and oh, and who are we? Weren't we, weren't we also wanting to hunt bears? I mean, yeah. it, well, no, actually. They said, well, the name of your boat made us think that you were here to hunt bears. And we went, well, no, actually, we're here to see them and photograph them. We don't want to kill them. And Eric said, well, you know, you know, like what you've done is unlawful and I'm going to have to report you. And they were like pretty much begging us not to report them. Uh, we did report them. This is a very short story of the, the whole story. We did report them and, uh, and they were, they had a, a fine. I don't remember what the fine was, but it wasn't enough in our books. And the fellow had, was not supposed to hunt for a year, anything for a year. But, you know, how, who's going to police that? Mm -hmm. And this all took place in a B.C. provincial park. Wow. So, so people think that we have parks and that that means no wildlife are killed in the parks. But there's, there's a prime example. 
Mm-hmm. And we'll never know um, how many of these actually happen either. I mean, that's, that's exactly right. It's a very remote area. There aren't enough uh, people that are out there that, uh, with the proper mandates to, well, there aren't enough people to yep. oversee these things, and uh, possibly not with the right mandates to do anything about it if they caught it. Well, and realistically, I mean, you, based on my, you know, overly high levels of anxiety about some subjects. Uh, you know, approaching strangers with guns and a garbage bag on a remote beach. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen that movie. Um, so like <laughs> for you and your husband to do that, that that's a great personal risk uh, to do that. Well, we feel very strongly about um, about being bears being killed for any reasons, but, you know, in particular at that moment when they're being killed illegally, it, it, uh, we, we knew what we had to do and, you know, we had uh, witnesses on board the boat, and I was photographing the whole thing while Eric was talking to these people. So, mm. um, you, know, you know, yes, I mean, it might not seem like the best idea, but it, but it's what we did because we feel very passionate about looking after all of our wildlife. And, you know, you know, we take people to see bears, and we make money from taking people to be to see bears. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying we did you know, that it's just a complete charitable cause. I mean, it does cost a lot of money to take people to see bears, but, you know, we we want people to learn about the true nature of bears and, and their habitat and the First Nations people in whose territory we're traveling and 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 killing the bears just, you know, just doesn't fit in with any of that. Well, in talking about diversity, uh, as you were talking, uh, a elderly gentleman went up my streets uh, with a pink motorcycle helmet, no shirt on a dirt bike, very slowly. Um, so we do see some interesting things here in Hamilton too. Um, you do. I yes. can, I can, I can I, say. Yes, I love this. Sounds city. very interesting. <laughs> Wish I was there with my camera. It could have been a good story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, any, anytime you're in town, feel free to come sit and look out my window and you'll get a bunch of stories. Um, <laughs> Now, well, that would be lovely. When we're talking about the future of this, um, and it, this came up in last week's episode too, we were talking about the seal hunts and what public opinion was showing. Um, mm-hmm. The future to me seems to be one of the two. We're either going to kill grizzly bears or we're going to protect them. And uh, and I don't want to say, use, I don't want to use the term use them, but uh, uh, create the ecotourism industry around viewing them. Um, with appropriate protections in place. How do we, in your opinion, and, and based on your experience, your firsthand knowledge, um, go about making that future the one that we choose? Well, I think that um, for, for us and virtually anybody that, uh, you know, that we're friends with, um, people that come on the boat, uh, you know, from British Columbia, uh, we, we won't we won't rest until there is a complete and utter ban on killing grizzly bears for any reason whatsoever. I mean, if there is a case where um, First Nations people uh, need a bear for some sort of ceremonial purpose or uh, the hide for a ceremonial purpose, but they're going to use all the rest of the bear. I mean, all that has to be worked out between those people and the government. That isn't any of my business. Mm-hmm. But the rest of it, Killing for cash, kicks, and trophies, that all has to end. Well, and I, I certainly think, too, the, uh, I have read, and I am by no means an expert on this, but I have read that when an animal is killed, um, whether in a conflict scenario or for some other reason, that quite frequently the, uh, the carcass will be taken to um, a First Nations community where they can make use of uh, the animal for ceremonial purposes. So it's not even that they need to go out and take a bear. Uh, sometimes right. there is that opportunity. Right. Well, I leave, I leave what First Nations and the government work out. Uh, I leave that up to them to work out. But, yep. um, and, and interesting that, that, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that you said that, that those, um, parts of the bear, when, Say for in when humans are in conflict with bears, because I refuse to say bears are in conflict with humans. I think every single time that a bear gets into trouble, the humans could have done mm. something different. But um, in BC, I I don't know of many times 
where when um, um, somebody in authority, I won't get into mentioning names, but somebody in authority has has killed a bear because it, they have deemed it dangerous. Um, I I don't know of many examples of those bears being taken and given to First Nations, the, the local First Nations people. So hmm. it's a nice idea, but it's, uh, I, I don't think that happens too often here. That's unfortunate. If it does, I would love somebody to call and tell you. Yes, hopefully we will hear. I would love hear. to know about that. Hope, yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to pull some of that out. Um, I just think that... Um, you know that British Columbians are going to need to need to be very vocal. You know because I don't believe that the majority of British Columbians want grizzly bears to be killed for cash kits and trophies. And I don't believe that the majority of British Columbians, especially those that are involved in the conservation of grizzly bears uh, from a non-consumptive point of view, um, believe that people are that people need to go out and kill grizzly bears for meat. So, so those people that want the, the, the killing of grizzly bears, uh, ended are going to have to be extremely vocal because there are organizations from outside our own country who are being very vocal with our government and other organizations within our, our, uh, province. Um, so British Columbians, you know, if they want, if they want this ended, they're going to have to speak up or even people from inside our own country. You know, um, do British Columbians want the policy of the day of their wildlife and how the wildlife are looked after? Do they want that dictated by people from outside the country or do they want it dictated by those of us that live here and um, want it preserved? To learn more about Trish and Ocean Adventures or book your getaway, visit them online at oceanadventures.bc.ca. That's the show for this week. My deep thanks to Trish for joining me for this in-depth and honest conversation, and all of you for joining us. Remember to subscribe to Defender Radio for free updates on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or iHeartRadio right on your smartphone, and follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Until next time, this is Michael Howie for Defender Radio, reminding you to stay informed and stay strong.